गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम किशन सर गुड इवनिंग मैम प्रतीक्षा व्हाट इज द स्टेटस आई मीन आर वी सपोज टू स्टार्ट okay good evening everyone i welcome you all on the online net of sat mentoring lecture series organized by alumni association department of english and competitive literary studies saurashtra university we have made these uh, series right with 30 lectures and we have already discussed modern and postmodern writings and criticism in the last few sessions we had the discussion on victorian and romantic age and today we are going to have the session on neo classical age today we have with us mr kishan joshi who is going to lead this session uh if i just give a brief about sir then mr kishan joshi is pursuing phd presently on translation studies he has done his mphil on the same that is translation studies and he has translated selected stories of pannalal patel he has published a few papers and at the same time a book also and he has done a workshop with national translation mission so we are very fortunate to have you here with us and i would like to now request you to take over the session please sir <laughs> thank you very much komal ma'am pratiksha ma'am and this is certainly my fortune to to be here <coughs> i think we shall begin right pratiksha ma'am without any further ado ah okay. uh, yes sir please okay let me share these slides is the slide visible yes sir yes okay. Okay. okay good evening all of you the topic today given to me is neo classical age satires and periodicals however we shall be talking about the first part only and not the latter part because latter part will be uh, discussed in the later lecture or in the second lecture so primary focus of this lecture Uh, will be satires of the neo classical age now when we say neo classical age we have a very wide time span as you see on uh, the screen that is 60 6085 among mm -hmm. which we have sub ages also or sub titles also which are as following <clears throat> but uh, before we begin i uh, also would like to tell you so that you can keep in in mind that in this lecture we shall be only dealing with the fundamentals and basics and we shall also try to understand what is satire uh, the the sub genres of satires and some relevant or uh, other genres that uh, refer to the uh, satire or that resemblance is that resembles the satires because if we then talk about the particular work i say for example if we talk about when 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 i take the name of a satire you may have so many names in your mind including uh, not only the literary works but including Uh, the films and other arts uh, a form of arts also right so uh, while categorize categorizing a particular work uh, let's say animal farm or 1984 when we talk about we also should be able to categorize or classify them in a very particular sub genre also so that we also shall talk about the sub genres of the satires and so forth now under the neo classical age we have restoration augustan and age of sensibility also now let me uh, remind you uh, in the lecture of hardeep sir if you remember uh, hardeep sir uh, hardeep singh gohil he uh, presented us uh, the comparative dialogue or the comparative box between dialogue box or the table between uh, the characteristic of uh, neo classical age or the augustan age 
and the characteristic of the uh, romantic age especially pertaining to the literary works right i i hope you remember then uh, let me also try to remind you about a very recent and the previous lecture where uh, uh, surbi madam surbi parmar madam also talked about the or she tried to trace the seeds of the romantic age and she she uh, she came to the conclusion that the traces or the uh, seeds of this romantic age bears its uh, a credit to the neoclassical age now what is such there in the neoclassical age uh, which has uh, in a way inspired which has in a way uh, given a hint to the romantic age we know that the french revolution is one among them but we have the last age over here on your screen the age of sensibility this age of sensibility is also one of the remarkable uh, age which gives the uh, seeds to the romantic age we shall be talking about it in a, a descriptive manner uh, later too but we have restoration <coughs> from 6060 to 7000 then we have augustan from 7000 to 45 45 and then age of sensibility 45 to 85 now there are some lesser known further names and why why i am taking them over here is because they are more uh, important for our discussion today than the uh, more famous names like the restoration augustan and sensibility and they are the age of reason the age of enlightenment the age of pop johnson the two other names which i will be focusing upon or emphasize upon is the age of scandals there is a critic named d h white who says or who forcefully and aggravately argues that this age that means neoclassical age should be considered more as a age of scandal than the restoration or augustan or age of sensibility because there has been so many scandals among the tradition among the customs among the society there there have been many vices follies and so forth and that is why it should be Uh, more preferable to call it a age of scandal than the other ages and there is also a, a critic who says it should be called an age of exuberance overflow let's say overflow of or overshow of everything in every manner like again if you remember mr surbi has already told us that tradition was emphasized in the age of neoclassical age right these are still i am i am foregrounding this is not the core discussion of the topic but these are some of the things which you should keep in the mind now keep this uh, in a side and let us move to the next because we'll try to scatter around some of the topics and then we'll try to come to the convergence now to know about the literature especially in the neo classical age historical background is very much important it is obviously important in the other ages too but why satires and periodicals are given to me why not only or why the title is the satires and uh, uh, periodicals of the neo classical age why it is not simply neo classical age why it is not simply uh, the uh, literature of neo classical age or why not the drama why not novel and so forth why satire and periodical has a reason and the reason is in the background of uh, or in the historical background or some of the incidents that took place during this age let's see what are the uh, incidents or historical political backgrounds that shaped the neo classical age literature which has been a very pivotal and around which the literature evolved and revolved uh, we can say the both now it will not be inappropriate to conclude in the beginning itself and substantiate it later i i am i am going to tell you a word and mark the word very much careful in your mind store this word and the word is gentleman gentleman was the word which was on the tip of uh, which was on the tip of the tongue of every people almost of the age some other similar words like elegance decency tradition gentlemanship pride honor these were the other words which were very frequently coming to the tip of the and tongue of the people of the age right and why it is so because they broke with the uh, previous age where there was again a city comedy and so forth charles was restored and before this charles the charles one who was very much tyrannic in his uh, uh, attitude and in in his rule so 
after uh, the restoration the charles 2 when he came he became very much uh, pompous he became very much uh, rich in the manner but not obviously a king is rich by the wealth but rich in the manner of said the theaters were reopened we know but what sort of art was performed in the theater is also one of the question and what sort of uh, art drama was this king charles like to watch more also inspires his uh, drama taste or the drama writers novel writers the poetry writers to write accordingly so say in the age of restoration uh, most of us know the basic that charles 1 was executed because uh, the 11 years of tyranny so many taxes and what not and and uh, for the more detail you can also ask the google or take the help of the google but this is simply briefing because we have long way to go i tell you and uh, i hope that i'll be able to uh, complete it in the lecture so charles 1 was getting executed then we know that a common uh, wealth came under the oliver cromwell then charles 2 was restored then there were two this party who, who were coming to the prominence in this age as uh, particularly wig and the tory now i have also tried to trace what make wig wig and what makes tory a tory where uh, it should not be stated uh, so uh, uh, as 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 wig came out of the protestant descent years then protestant came from the puritans and puritan comes from the anglican and it goes back directly to the henry who broke with the church and he considered himself the uh, king of everything and also of the church so he is the supreme now so it goes back to the henrys a break with the church and then setting himself as a anglican and then anglican and catholic two uh, christian divisions we have then so this charles 2 was restored to the throne and wig presented a ex exclusion bill where they claimed that no catholic person should come to or should uh, uh, they they restricted uh, catholic people from coming or inheriting to the throne and then we also know that uh, it was rejected uh, and they not become uh, very much successful and still james 2 came but after james 2 arrival also uh, we have his rejection also in the glorious all the uh, bloodless revolution then say what what makes augustan age an age of augustus so it is because the practices of the augustan writers like horace and virgil as the models and we all know again who was the practitioner uh, practitioner of horace and virgil <clears throat> not only that but tradition gentleman elegance decency honor and the pride these were the words as i have told you these were the background soci societal background we can say then age of reason and enlightenment is also one of the uh, subtitle given to the neo classical age and what makes age of enlightenment or the reason as so is because of the rousseau voltaire and emmanuel kant but the pre cursors of these people or the age of reason and enlightenment uh, can be tra traced back to the lock hobbs and bacon we know francis bacon as a person of sa then lock who wrote uh, more about thoughts intellectuality who wrote more letters and essays like essays on education human concern human understanding and so forth then we have hobbes for leviathan right but this voltaire rousseau and emmanuel kant who emphasized upon maturity who emphasized upon wit and intellectuality they also propounded the clarity of the thoughts uh, the reasons and not uh, like let's say by god or by god or let's say the blind faith in the religion so this makes the age of reason or the enlightenment where it was responded or uh, it was uh, opposed by the age of sensibility people or the age of sensibility writers in response to the reason in response to the clarity of thought and so forth or enlightenment these people who who brought in the uh, manner or the logic of sensibility they they said or they were of the opinion that human instinct basic instinct or our emotions are our true guide and not the reason and not the mind so they said heart but not the mind and those people said mind but not the heart where locke in one of his uh, essays says 
that uh, nurture is more important than the nature these are the exact words of a uh, lock uh, from thoughts on concerning education you can find them so lock where he is emphasizing on nurture than the nature in the education so he says education should be provided in a way that a person becomes gentleman and it cannot be a uh, through the uh, it cannot be naturally it cannot come out of the instinct so a person cannot learn on his own how to be the gentleman is what lock was of the view whereas age of sensibility people they say no our natural instincts guides us towards our life it was also respond to the hobbes who considered people or the men as a selfish and being greedy so these are some of the uh, historical background now let's say i have already said in the beginning that this historical backgrounds makes or inspires the writer to write now when we say age of restoration from the beginning uh, again look back to the uh, beginning where i have written age of restoration charles one getting executed and so forth what what comes to your mind i mean which literary works comes comes to comes to your mind which talks about charles one and charles two or the restoration or also about the exclusion bill <clears throat> you can put your uh you can put your thoughts in comment box but for that i'll have to also check the chat box find anyone which literary works comes to your mind when we talk about charles one getting executed charles two coming to throne back when we talk about exclusion bill and so forth <coughs> anyone if there is no one then i i think i should pro proceed because we have long to go <clears throat> fine let me continue then <clears throat> these works bear the resem uh, resemblances or reference to the historical backgrounds absalom and achitophel we know which uh, brings the biblical background where uh, david is also there and david's son is there so the same happened as same was happening now let me also tell you that king himself asked dryden this is a work of dryden we know he asked he, he dryden himself to write a poem which talks about the current age but this absalom and achitophel is impartial work which does not favor anything then we have mac flecno but mac flecno is more personal and direct uh, then it is uh, general in the manner then we have also the medal and hudibras by samuel butler now let us talk about the augustan age <coughs> where the horace and virgil were practiced who was practicing him then we have pope and jonathan swift pope as the perfectionist of the horatian style then about age of reason and enlightenment then we have all the uh, the writers and the thinkers that we have mentioned among walter rousseau's works emmanuel kant's works and so forth <clears throat> but the precursor that we have is also lock hobbes and bacon as the precursors then age of sensibility is not our focused topic because we are more focused about and concerned about the satires than the age of sensibility but still for our understanding the people who wrote about the sensibility uh, sensibility are samuel richardson henry fielding smollett and lawrence stern and you can also uh, recall the works of them and can try to uh, compare them with the age of sensibility <clears throat> let us move forward <clears throat> since we are mainly talking about the satires what is satire now we have three different uh, uh, divisions or category in the satire and we have also a uh, latin roman and greek bearings or the belongings for the word satire coming to the practice where horatian and juvenal which you see on the screen uh, are from the roman and the manipan and the horatian are from the greek now <clears throat> the name are taken from the practitioner of itself i mean from the roman horace was one then juvenal was one Uh, from the roman and minipan 
who was the pupil of Socrates and uh, his co-student who is born V O R R simply and then out of his writing we have the name Horatian. So what is Horatian satire which is simply gentle and mild in the tone which is not very much strong and its main aim is humor and not the negativity. So which does not talk about or which, which does not try to refute anyone which is not condemning uh, which does not harm anybody's respect or repute because as Dryden say in the preface of uh, McFleckno that you should not take something which you cannot restore to. So someone's reputation is not in your hand. So uh, we know that he wrote uh, McFleckno and the full title is uh, the blue protestant of T.S. So he simply put T.S. not Thomas Shadwell, right? Uh, the Thomas Shadwell, the person whom he was attacking in McFleckno. But there is no direct uh, comparison or there is no direct mentionation uh, of Thomas Shadwell. He keeps his satire very limited and very general. And he does not refute him in personal, but he refutes the follies only. He refutes his uh, false intellectuality only. And it was also after getting several times attacked by him. Now, we may also wonder what, what were the reasons of these two people coming into the uh, this quarrel or the fight. <clears throat> then there were, again, there are some, uh, there are many reasons of being those people in the, in the contrary to each other. Number one is the political biases. One belongs to Whig and another belongs to the Tory. Then one is Anglican and another is Catholic. Then their views on poetry, then their views on the satire and so forth. So these are some of the reasons they being uh, contrary or opposite to each other. But Horatian satires are more gentle, more mild in the tone and they are not exaggerated and they are not very much strong in the uh, nature or the manner. And its primary intention is to bring the laughter and not the negativity. So they simply point the follies. Now let's take some of the examples. If we are to consider the examples, we have moral essays of Pope. Then we have Gulliver's Travel, where there is no direct attack on anybody, but it is an attack on the societal, or, or let's say mankind itself. Uh, the Gulliver's Travel in four parts we have: Lil, uh, Lilliput, Lalputa, Bob Dingen, and uh, the last one, uh, beginning from the edge, but. Uh, unable to pronounce because the name itself is so and we also have adventure of Huckleberry Finn so these are some of the examples of Horatian satires then we have Juvenalian which again bears the uh, its traces from the Roman writer which is more harsh strong and exaggerated and which is more political than direct and then uh, about the uh, human follies Let's take some of the examples. We have the modest proposal by Jonathan Swift, which is very much political into its nature, which talks about uh, Ireland and its political issues. Then we have Medal and Absalom and Achistophel, as we have seen in the previous slide, which talks about the uh, restoration of the Charles II. Then the last one uh, in the among the uh, category of satire, we have Manipan and Voracian. These both were, in a way, pupil of the Socrates and these both were the uh, co-students also. And they come from the Greek. Now, this Manipan has tried to write a comedy about the dialogues of Socrates, where his intention was not very much about satire. We may also wonder then why the original work of the Horish uh, Juvenile and Manipan were not called satire and they were called comedy or something else. Because satire as a form itself was not very much developed or as much developed as it developed in the age of August or a, a, in the age of neoclassical age. So we have Manipan and Voracian, which is indirect, which concerns single minded person like the person who is bigot, we say Dharmand, then a person who considers himself a pedant and braggart, a person who is very much miser quack or the seducer. We have some examples in it and you can have uh, some more also <clears throat> in your mind like allies in Wonderland and Animal Farm. 
then among this attire people often confuse and use these words alternatively uh, the satire irony and sarcasm and uh, let me also clarify that these three words are not very much similar but they have their distinctive use and meaning see satire is a form in a way the whole work should be considered as a satire where in a in a single satire there can be so many devices technical technicalities used by a writer so it is not necessary that in a satire the whole work will follow only one style of writing you have lampoon you have caricature you have picaresque and so forth so a person a, a writer may is at liberty to use various forms of uh, satire but satire is a name given to the work itself then what is irony irony is something which is meant but not said which is always there and sarcasm is or sarcasm is the way of applying irony right so sarcasm sarcasm is application irony is something which is meant and not said and satire is overall form or the genre <clears throat> now moving to the next slide what are the various techniques which would come to our mind when we talk about the general word the umbrella word satire i mean to say suppose in your daily communication when you are talking and when you use satire what are the ways that you would use we are going to be a teacher and we are very uh, very much uh, aware of students mimicking us so we say mimicry right so a person trying to mimic is one way of the technicalities or the device few of the words i have already already mentioned we have caricature what is caricature a caricature is a character presented in a ridiculous way in a way that people would laugh at him say for example we have uh, charlie chaplin and mr bean but we should until and unless or let's say uh, uh, at least that after we know the very much distinctive meaning of these words we would not or we should not put uh, charlie chaplin as a caricature because he is not intended to be the caricature but he is intended to be the something else and what is it will will discuss but mr min appropriately uh, can be taken as a example for the caricature then we have lampoon now this lampoon is a short form a short dialogue where caricature is applied i mean the lines where you apply or where you try to say uh, in absolem and acistofel we have zimri's dialogue so this dialogues are considered to be the lampoon then we have burlesque which we are going to discuss in the uh, length then we have parody which is also there and the picaresque right <clears throat> there are two types of burlesque now we may wonder what is burlesque and what is satire let me tell you that burlesque is nothing but a form of satire then you may again wonder that sir we have the categories of satire but they were the categories of satire there were not the technicalities of the devices that you would use for the satire so this is one of the technicality or the device that you would use for the satire one among them is burlesque so we have satire in three way categorized now we have burlesque and again in burlesque we have two more categories one is high burlesque and another one is low burlesque then furthermore in the high uh, high burlesque and low, uh, low burlesque we will have two uh, further categories which we shall talk in later now let's say uh, let's uh, let's see what is high and low burlesque this burlesque are divided on the basis of style and form are of the high level or of the dignity then the subject matter applied incongruently <clears throat> to simplify the sentence how burlesque are divided is based on the style and form so sometimes what happens is style and form is higher style and form is dignified then the subject matter you may have some examples in your uh, mind and if you don't have will have some example uh, in the letter slide and which will make it easy for you so right now just keep in this mind uh, keep this in mind 
that they are divided on the basis of what they are divided on the basis of style and the subject so what hap what happens is sometimes style is higher dignified and subject is low and opposite to this sometimes subject is high and the style is low and this way we have two divisions high and low burlesque what is high burlesque high bur high burlesque is or high burlesque applied is when the style and the form is high or dignified and the subject matter the subject matter or the concept itself is very trivial or very low and what is low burlesque which is very much contrary when we have good subject when we we have a good concept to talk about but we uh, but we we put it in a way which make it ridiculous which is a way of mimicking it uh, i don't know whether uh, most of you or all of you have watched it wall e an animated movie which is a very good concept uh, it talks about it is a sci-fi movie and it talks about the earth getting destroyed so which is a very high in the subject but it but it is an animation movie and the style is ridiculous right then we have crudes also now let's take the another example of high burlesque <clears throat> where the subject matter is low but the Uh, uh style and form are dignified and high then we have uh rep of the lock <coughs> high burlesque based on whether the high burlesque imitates type or genre or the work of author now as i have told you satire has three category i know this is little complex and confusing but more repetition would make it easy three types of satire horatian juvenile many pun horatian is gentle and mild it does not attack anyone directly its primary aim is humor and not the negativity juvenile you can remember it is more political exaggerated strong and very much harsh and many pun is indirect which talks about single minded person then one of the technicality of using a satire is burlesque in burlesque we have again two categories high burlesque and low burlesque based on the style and the subject matter then among the high burlesque we have again further categories and these categories are based on whether the genre is mocked or mimicked or the work is mimicked or the author is mimicked when these three things are mimicked we have parody or we have mock epic and mock heroic parody is a distinctive style and manner of the work and author the parody itself is to ridicule something so we have example as pamela uh, and and uh, if we talk about the full uh, title of pamela then we have a virtue rewarded so we have good subject right uh, richardson talking about the virtues and the manner and the uh, gentle manly shape and so forth which is parodied by henry fielding in shamela and joseph andrews both and and what were the uh, statements or what were the ground on which ground he attacked on pamela he says when pamela getting seduced so many times by mr b in the story you cannot avoid mr b being vulgar or a seducer so virtue is rewarded necessarily it is right that pamela is rewarded but what about mr b so based on this reason based on this concept he wrote shamela and joseph andrew and this shamela and joseph andrew inspired again uh, richardson to write about grandison charles grandison who is a male pamela we can say so a virtuous pen, a virtuous men or a virtuous pamela in the parody we have charlie chaplin why why charlie chaplin comes into parody and he does not come into the lampoon or into the caricature caricature we as we have seen a person uh, presented as a, uh, a ridiculous in a ridiculous manner because charlie chaplin's concept are high one of the basic sentence if you remember uh, charlie chaplin once Uh, quoted somewhere that I like to walk in rain because no one knows I am crying. So, do you think this is a, a, a low subject? It's a very philosophical sentence in a manner to understand, isn't it? And most of the comedy of the Charlie Chaplin, if you see, talks about unemployment, 
uh, the societal follies and so forth so his subject and, and and the concept are high but he is presenting him a, a, them into the uh, mimicking way or into the parodying way right then we have mock epic since we have the word itself epic it talks about or it it parodies or it mimics this style or the genre but not the work or the author say for example in the uh, hip hop lock uh, alexander pop also uh, invokes the digni uh, the the deities the goddess the god and so forth as we have in the paradise lost in the beginning then uh, writing style in the rap of lock is also uh, high in the manner which is parodied then we have a war also and a war for what a war for the lock itself uh, miss feramar right <clears throat> so the cause of the war is very trivial is very low and which makes so this is simply uh, mimicking or parodying the epic form and that is why we have rep of the lock in mock epic or mock heroic epic uh, both are the uh, simon tenor uh, uh, similar words you can use them alternatively then these two were the high burlesque we have low burlesque too among which we have eudibrastic what is this eudibrastic it comes after the original work of samuel butler and which is dog real now what is dog real uh, we we need to understand this word first the dog real is a sort of poem which is not a poem it's a kind of simply matching the rhythms matching the rhymes like we have rap song these days which should not be considered as a poem they are the dog reals so uh, if i try to translate roughly into gujarati or hindi they should be called jodakna okay uh, જોડકણા જોડીને કવિ થઈ જવું છે અને કાચના ટુકડાને રવિ થઈ જવું છે આ મિરર કેન નોટ બી ધી સન એન્ડ બાય સિમ્પલી મેચિંગ ધી રિધમેટિક લાઇન્સ યુ કેન નોટ બિકમ ધી પોએટ સો ધીઝ ઇઝ વોટ હેપન્ડ ઇન ધી યુડી બ્રાસ ઇન ધી સેમ્યુઅલ બટલર એન્ડ હુ અ બટલર ઇઝ ટેકિંગ હિઝ ઇન્સ્પિરેશન ફ્રોમ ઇઝ નથિંગ બટ ધી ફેરી ક્વીન બાય એડમન સ્પેન્સર એન્ડ એસ્પેશિયલી બુક ટુ where temperance and guyo uh, guyon yes temperance and guyon are the main character or the main hero <clears throat> but here uh, butler represents them not uh, for the wit hudibras as a hero uh, not say for example following the wit not following the honesty but he is more inspired from the uh, corruption from the politics and so forth then the last among the low burlesque we have travesty which is a lofty subject so we have a good subject but presented in grotesque manner uh, for which we have a movie or a film a young frankenstein which is a travesty of mary shelley's original work frankenstein for which or for the travesty you can use the uh, other devices like lampoon and caricature which we have already talked about putting the character in a ridiculous way like zimri in absolem and mr bin we have <coughs> among the one now let's coming to the point and i i, I don't think still uh, we are coming to a writer and it is 640 but let us uh, continue still we got 10 minutes right i think uh, pratiksha ma'am still we have 10 minutes to go because i have still so many slides to continue uh, yes yes okay sir. okay now pope being a satirist and what are the reasons of pope being satirist i could find this three number one is his birth in the catholic and in the days of when this pope lived there was uh, anti catholic hysteria you understand the word hysteria right uh, like uh, rasore me contha uh, um, uh, mimicry or a parody which was so much rapidly uh, forwarded not only forwarded but reached to many people so it is what we call hysteria so in the days when pope lived there was anti catholic uh, hysteria and this person 
Pope by birth was a Catholic. So this is number one that he is more sensitive for the satirist to attack on. The another reason uh, we have is he being more sensitive for the attacks because of his deformity. We all know that he had a uh, hump on his back, right? <clears throat> and the third reason is his tendency towards the perfecting Horatian style of writing, decorum in the poetry. So absolutely, and, and no doubt, he was a man of perfection. He, he talked more about the decorum in poetry, styles, meters, and so forth. So all those people who were out of this law or out of the decorum in the poetry, he attacked them. But again, it was not that like Dryden. Uh, it was not Pope who started it. It was not Dryden who started it. It was Lewis Theob Theobald who started. It was uh, Thomas Shedwell who started. And after enduring them very much, they gave their uh, works in the opposition. Now, see, this image is again important uh, for us to understand. This is actually a painting. And uh, itself is a, uh, uh, a way of mimicking of others on the pop. I tell you that Pope was, by his, uh, by his uh, opponents, Pope was named as Ape, A-P-E, Ape for monkey. And these initials were taken from his name itself, Alexander, Pope, A, and Pope, from Pope, P and E, Ape. And he is also presented in the painting the same way. You also see the crown, right, uh, on the head of it. This crown is nothing but uh, a representation of his belongingness to the Catholic. And he is sitting on the works of himself. And uh, there, uh, which is illegible uh, over there, the writings which you are not, uh, which nobody is able to read. There, one word is written and it is know thyself. Aap apne ko pehle dekho. It was what the others satirists were trying to attack on Pope. Now so much aggravated by so many attacks, obviously Pope would not uh, sit in the silence and sit back in the relaxation. And out of which we have uh, very much important and canonical works out of the pen of Alexander Pope. Rep of the Lock, the Dunciad, then essay on criticism, essay on men, and epistles, and also the pastorals. But when we talk about satire, we should talk about especially two: the Rep of the Lock and the Dunciad. Among which the Rep of the Lock is mock heroic epic, but the Dunciad is more important because the title itself is coming out of the Duns. Duns means the goddess, which is taken from the goddess of the dullness. So he is attacking all those people who are dull but consider themselves witty or intellectual. <coughs> so, as I have already mentioned, essay on criticism, where he suggests critic more than the poet. So uh, this is suggested reading. Uh, one should read essay on criticism of Pope, where he is talking more about the critic, because obviously that. Uh, and, and, and again, you may also wonder and you should ask why Alexander Pope and Lewis Theobald come into the uh, this choral is because of uh, once Alexander Pope wrote about Shakespeare. He edited some of the prefaces uh, on the works of Shakespeare, which were not liked by. And there was also some ideological difference uh, with the Lewis Theobald. So Lewis Theobald in the return in the attack of the, of the edition of the works of Alexander Pope wrote a Shakespeare Restored is a work by Lewis Theobald. And then this war of the pamphlets and works started. Then we have Rep of Lock where uh, for the sake of uh, cut of a lock there is uh, machinery used uh, from the Trojan War. There is a war and then it ends very much abruptly and comically. Those who have uh, read or uh, studied Rep of Luck would know the story. So I would not go into uh, much. Dunciad, 
<clears throat> which is in four books, which we shall be uh, analyzing, interpreting uh, very much insightfully into the next lecture. So I'm not taking it right now. <clears throat> then he also founded Scribblers Club. And for for again this scribblers club, we must understand the word is itself scribbler. It means to write anything uh, reasonless, which is non reasonable. When you write non reasonable and unreadable in in unreadable manner, you become a scribbler. So say for example, when uh, you you want to annotate something and your teacher is uh, going very much fast. And you simply jot it down in illegible writing, which cannot be read. You become a scribbler. But here, it is not the only uh, intention naming its club as a scribbler club. It was also intellectual people making the uh, trivial mistakes. Now, this was not an intended association. It was informal association found uh, in 1714 and ended in 45 with the uh, death of. Uh, him and the major members there are some more also the major members uh, to form this club were the Pope Swift, Arbuthnot and John Gay uh, and the work collective work uh, uh, which came uh, was Martinus Scribblers which is one of the character and it takes its inspiration from the Dryden's translated work which is in Latin so I haven't put it over here it is also uh, hard to pronounce, but you can easily find them in the Google uh, with a simple tip. And this Martin is taken from Mar Ol, which means a person who harms all. So say, for example, uh, great people, when they make a, a, a little mistake, it affects it affects very much because he is a great people. He is a great person and there are so many followers of him. So when he makes a mi uh, mistake, his followers would obviously con consider it as a height. So there are other peoples who are also going to make such mistakes. So Mar Ol and Martinus Scribblers is one of the character in uh, the uh, pamphlet which were produced by this club. <clears throat> I think we should stop here because uh, we are moving to the, uh, the next topic. And I think I should take it from the next step, next lecture. I would ask you for the comments or <clears throat> for the commentary if you have any okay uh, thank you very much sir uh, now the session is open for the discussion and if you have any queries you can uh, put it on the chat box or you can unmute yourself and let us know Uh, students, um, kindly uh, put down your questions in the chat box <clears throat> or something that you need to comment on. There is no commentary or uh, no questions in, in, in two uh, uh, situations. One is when they understand everything. And, the and other one is, is? I, I, I won't say they don't understand anything. When uh, I would say when a teacher failed. <clears throat> Okay, uh, by the time by the time they put on some question, uh, may I ask something? Please, please. You need uh, okay. to uh, something. Uh, okay, uh, I'm not actually, I mean, this is actually of an in introduction and I, I had studied a few things while doing masters. But I mean, uh, if we try to dress out the things, like I mean, uh, from the Plato onwards, we have this discussion called what is the purpose of literature? Right then, hmm. it was entertainment or uh, is it education? Now, hmm. uh, what do you think? I mean, is the purpose mainly here? Because you know, I think this is the age where satire actually come to the forefront. Hmm. So, I mean, I mean, if we want to dress out something in this context, I mean, how? What would your comment would be? Okay, okay, uh, good question. In a way, uh, if we look back to the Greek history we had two major forms comedy and tragedy yes out of which aristophan and uh, meander uh, these were the people like uh, and these were the people who were uh, talking about tragedy and uh, comedy 
out of which we cannot uh, bring the traces from the tragedy when we are talking about the satire. We can obviously take some of the traces from the comedy when we talk about uh, uh, satires. We know that satires, uh, uh, say for example, satires main aim is to correct the follies, be it personal, be it societal, be it political or be it whatsoever. It is to correct something, it is to amend something. In, in John Dryden's words, if a satire does not end with the amendments, it is a failure of the satire, is what Dryden himself said. Right, number one. But out of comedy, we can trace some of the traces for the satires, but it would be not very much appropriate. Why? Because when we uh, try to look at with the aesthetic sense to this both of the genre, uh, comedy and satire, the uh, uh, main or the primary aim of comedy is different and the primary aim of satire is different. Otherwise, we have so many controversies uh, before uh, this Alexander and be before this uh, uh, restoration age. Say, for example, Edmund Spencer. It begins with the Edmund Spencer. Uh, uh, sorry, Philip Sidney. Uh, Four Ages of Poetry was written by uh, Nitin sir, you would know. Uh, four Ages of, uh, in, 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 in the opposition to which or in the response to which Philip Sidney wrote an apology for poetry. So it begins from there also. But aesthetic sense, primary aesthetic uh, Russia, out of the comedy which we have is laughter, entertainment and humor, which is not the only purpose of satire. So in this way, there is distinction that satire's primary aim is to amend something, is to correct something. Right? This is what I would or I can add up to your question and hope uh, you are a little bit satisfied with the answer. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, we have a few comments like uh, Archita actually mentioned that it's words quite good, crisp and clear. Uh, Nitin sir uh, had a comment as well as something to add up or ask. Uh, how the thoughts of Lake uh, report, uh, sorry, related to education gave impetus to writing of the age, right? Uh, I think this is something comment as well as to add up. Okay, okay. Let me. Is it in chat box? Ah, uh, yes. Let me see how the thoughts of Locke related, related to, edu to education related to education gave impetus to the writing of the age. Uh, yes. very much, Nitin. Why this is also one of the uh, very much uh, insightful question, I would say, and not only the superficial question. Why? Because before, not only uh, 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 thoughts of Pope, but thoughts of Locke, especially thoughts on education, where I, uh, I have already mentioned, uh, Locke says that nature should be, sorry, nurture should be given importance and not the nature, is what uh, Locke said in his uh, essay. Uh, thoughts on the education. Then we also have uh, essay, not not essay on criticism, not men also, uh, discourse on original and progress of satire by John Dryden. <clears throat> and also some of his lectures, which also talks about uh, the role of education and the role of nourishment or the nurture uh, of the people. Because just because this gentleman tradition, decency, uh, these words were among the uh, people or th they were very much uh, hysteric among the people, the role of education was very much talked by almost all the uh, great thinkers of the age, especially uh, the Augustan age, excluding Dryden. Why I exclude Dryden? Because Dryden wrote uh, city comedies uh, in the manner of restoration age. So he belongs to both edge. So he wrote some of the comedies, city comedies, in, into the manner of uh, this restoration. And later, his letter works were uh, in the manner of this Augustan age. So there are some of his views also, which gave impetuous. So not only Pope's works, because Pope is not the first. It, it is what I mean to say. Before him, we have Immanuel Kant, uh, Rousseau, Voltaire, Locke, Hobbes, and so forth. And among them, uh, there is one more whom I am missing. <coughs> Vanity of Human Vices by Samuel Johnson. It is also there. But one particular work which was uh, uh, very much focused on education. Uh, 
I think lock only was that, but I need to, I, I would uh, need to find out it. Uh, not currently coming to mind. But this is what uh, I have to say to uh, your comment and question both. Nitin Bhai. Anything? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Kishan. Uh, one thing more I would like to know that uh, the names you uh, talked about were all were uh, prominent uh, philosophers of the time. Mm. So uh, they talked about the philosophy. But mm. while we are talking about the satire, mm. so what connection do you find between philosophy and satire? Mm. Because they, they were, the, they were, okay, okay, please continue. Uh -huh. Because the basic aim of satire, as you already said, that is to, to make amendment, but mm. in light manner. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let me... while we talk about philosophy, it's a bit high. Understood. And while we talk about satire, it's a comparatively bit low. Mm. Understood, understood. <clears throat> let me quote the uh, exact line from Emmanuel Kant's work, uh, what is enlightenment though we consider and call not only we uh, obviously critics call them philosophical uh, thinker but they are not only philosophical thinker they also propounded clarity of the thoughts and reasons see uh, who are the philosophical thinkers as uh, uh, the prominent name if we take are immanuel kant uh, rousseau and voltaire right i don't know about voltaire but i uh, i have something to say about immanuel kant and Rousseau, where Immanuel Kant himself in one of the essay titled as What is Enlightenment? He writes, man living his self-caused immaturity, where immaturity was the incapacity to use one's own intelligence without the guidance of the another. So this is not merely being, because see, when you say what is the connection of philosophy being satirical, so you must have somewhere underlying understanding of philosophy being irrational. But philosophy is not always irrational. Over here, uh, what uh, Immanuel Kant has to say is very much rational and he emphasizes upon intelligence. So he talks about maturity in a, in a single two sentence itself. He says, what is immaturity? Immaturity is self-caused immaturity, which is incapacity to use one's own intelligence. So out of this and out of the societal uh, follies, uh, it was necessary for Pope Jonathan Swift and some others. And not only these two, I would say also Henry Fielding being a different sort of satirist because uh, his genre is not specific satire, uh, but a parody. And parody is one of the burlesque we know, but uh, still he keeps both of both. I mean, uh, he keeps virtue also. He does not uh, reject gentlemen's if he does not uh, reject uh, virtues, but he keeps it along with it. He he shares them differently in Shamela and Joseph Andrews. So this is what I think I have to say for, to your question. So they are not merely irrational and philosophical, but they had to say about education, about maturity, about reason and about wit and int intellectuality too. <clears throat> Nitin Bhai, you there? Uh, I, I think uh, you got the answer, sir. Nitin, sir? Uh, yes, uh, sir, actually, yes, uh, yes. yes. Okay, he texted out. For uh, Thanks for the good thought. Okay, do we have any more questions from other participants? Okay, uh, seems no, uh, then uh, I uh, we would like to conclude this session wait, and I... Wait, wait, wait. Uh, okay, okay, yes. Just, yes, yes, just please, two sir. minutes more. Sure, uh, Since these nice nine people have retained so far uh, out of their uh, endurance and tolerance, uh, let me tell you about my next lecture. In the next lecture, we shall be trying to deeply look into uh, major works, major satirical works, works consisting Alexander Pope's works, Dryden's works, then very much uh, Samuel Richardson and Henry Fielding, these two people and uh, re from Restoration Dryden and Pope and Swift also. So this five to six people's work we shall be uh, talking in the next lecture, right? But before that, we must have the basic understanding of uh, this, what is satire, what is burlesque, parody, and so forth. 
and that is why i had to bring forth to you the fundamentals okay, and the basics of uh, it right yes this is from my side <coughs> yes over definitely to, i mean yes. yes yes definitely i mean unless and yes unless until we know about the form right uh, we would not be able to discuss works based on it so i mean that was quite thoughtful of you and uh, i would really like to thank you for your insightful discussion for the day i would like to uh, thanks participants also uh, towards the end i would like to just i mean make uh, mention uh, the last comment who was uh, who is talking about your wonderful lecture and uh, we will look forward for the next session that would be on wednesday so see you all on wednesday and thank you once again kishan sir for your you. beautiful and actually quite uh, you know enlightenment and lightful lecture thank you yeah thank you very much